But um, so yeah, just want to tell you really quickly what I'm going to talk about over the next 20 minutes. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is you know what makes great game audio. So what sets it apart from film and linear media? Um, you know, and why should you care? You know, why is it important to care about these things? Uh, next, you know, how can we take that and translate it into great mobile audio? You know, what's different about designing and composing for a handheld device and creating that audio experience there? And that's going to be the bulk of the talk. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what's next, you know, kind of where we should be heading, what we should be thinking about maybe, you know, some interesting, you know, look at the platform and where it's going. And then we can answer any questions. Um, so yeah, kind of a surface overview of these topics, but I'm going to present some things to, uh, to think about. So just so you know where I'm coming from, again, Richard, um, I'm the audio director at Hexney Audio. We're an LA-based studio. We do a lot of music sound dialogue for mobile, um, casual, PC, console, AAA outsourcing, one-man indie band, kind of everything in that range. So a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things and music sound and dialogue kind of being, you know, representing audio as a whole. So diving into to great game audio, you know, we've got music, sound, and dialogue. And that's our content. And that's what we have in a film. And that's the experience in a film. But in a game, we've got implementation to worry about. And that's really 50%, I think, of a great game audio experience, is how things are integrated, how they're played back in the game, and how the player's actions affect the actual content. So you take John Williams' fantastic music, you put it on loop for 30 seconds, and it's still going to fatigue a player. It's still not going to sound good. So I really think 50% of a great game audio experience comes down to the integration and the implementation and how it's played back in game. So why should you care? Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons, but I've kind of distilled it into two main topics. And that is emotion and also function. So from the emotional standpoint, audio is really an actual physiological key to tapping in to the emotional impact of a game. Meaning, when we look at something and it goes to our eyes and into our visual cortex in our brain, it's a fairly direct link. However, with sound, we hear something, it goes into our ears, and it actually first stimulates these primordial emotional processing centers in our brain in ways that visuals don't. So there's an actual physiological difference in how audio is perceived in our brains, and it has a difference on the impact in your game. So, you know, when you hear that piece of music, it's emotional, it makes you cry, or it makes you happy. And we can use this to drive what the player is experiencing, what they're feeling, and how they are interpreting your game. Um, you know, a good example of this is maybe like a slot machine credit roll-up sound, where we might be, you know, branding an experience and saying, this is the sound of you winning. You know, this is money being earned for you. You're winning when you hear this sound. You know, so you can also use this for evil, you know, if we were to start playing that sound when a player wins, you know, maybe they win a few cents or a dollar, but then they lose two dollars, they win a dollar, but, you know, they're winning all the time, but they're, they're losing overall. You know, if we're playing the sound that they associate with winning, we might get a player to keep playing, even though they're ultimately losing, because they hear this sound. So you can use it for great evil, but, uh, you know, being able to tap into that emotion is very important to, to getting people attached to your game. So next is function. You know, audio really lets us support the player actions that they do and also add a whole other dimension of information that we can give the player. So, uh, example, we're walking down a hallway. Maybe you hear some footsteps up ahead. Maybe you've got an oxygen tank on because the air is poison and you're running low on oxygen. Uh, maybe you're carrying a bomb at the same time and it's beeping. You know it's going to run out. Uh, all of these things are different information that we can receive via audio cues simultaneously in a way that visuals can't portray. You know, our brain can process lots of simultaneous audio information very quickly, and so we can, you know, both give instant feedback to a player and also lots of feedback at the same time. So if players are turning off your audio, you know, you're going to lose that emotional hook, but you're also going to lose the potential to make them a better player at your game because of the information they're going to be missing out on if you're tapping into it. So great mobile audio. I've kind of distilled this into four ideas. And the first is that mobile audio has to be iconic and it has to be rewarding in a way that differs from other game experiences because play sessions are very short. They're 15 minutes, five minutes, three seconds, uh, you know, checking in, they're maybe 30 minutes tops maybe. So it's gotta be iconic, it's gotta brand your experience quickly and it has to be memorable for the players. Um, I'm gonna dive into all of these deeper on the next slides. But the second one, 
is the playback system. You know, we're dealing with a very different frequency response on the speaker of a mobile device, so we need to be designing content with that in mind, and we need to be orchestrating music right from the get-go with the playback system in mind, unlike we have to do with a console game or a PC game. Next, it has to be non-fatiguing. So it's gotta be iconic, which probably involves repetition, but it's also gotta be non-fatiguing or a player's just gonna shut it off. So how can we accomplish that? Um, without making players hate the sound or turn it off. And then optimize performance. Obviously, we're dealing with tiny memory budgets, uh, small overall footprints, low CPU usage, so how can we take advantage of some of that? So the first example I want to show is in the re iconic and rewarding category. You know, branding your experience. So fantastic example of this is Hearthstone. Great audio, great game. I'm going to go ahead and just play a little clip. So the music is immediately recognizable as Hearthstone. If you've played it, you can shut the visuals off and instantly know this is Hearthstone. The music is very iconic and memorable, but it's also not, you know, right up there in front. And this is a battle, but we're not, you know, getting our blood pumping with it. It's sitting in the back. It's not fatiguing the player, but it's still there, setting the tone. And the same thing is true of the sound. You know, all of these sounds are instantly recognizable. And a big part of this is because Hearthstone, um, you know, I didn't work on it, don't have any, uh, you know, affiliation, but kind of looking at it, drawing the conclusion, you know, a lot of these, or most every sound and VO line in here has just one variation or, you know, no variations in terms of, you know, voice Q02 or 03. It's all one sound. And the reason being, it really helps brand the experience. You know, when you play that card, the player is, or the card is going to say the same VO line every single time. And we set up an expectation for the player. They, they hear it and they expect it to be there. And then when they do hear it, it's like a little reward. They know, you know, it feels good when you play the guy and he says the line, um, and you know what he's gonna say. Same thing is true of, you know, when you damage an enemy or when you attack them. All the same sound every time. So very iconic sounds. And they feel great, you know, they're hyper exaggerated. Um, but we've really created that iconic experience. Whereas if we were doing, you know, an, a big MMO RPG, um, you know, having one NPC say the same line every time you approach them would be extremely annoying. But in here, in this instance, it's, it just, it feels good because play sessions are shorter and the, the expectation on mobile is different. And then, you know, if your players, uh, absolutely love the, you know, lines or, uh, fall in love with it, you know, they might do something like this. Make a four hour loop on YouTube of the same VO line over and over. So, you know, uh, it's always good when players, uh, love what, what you've created. Anyway, um, so second thing is playback system. It's iconic and rewarding, but we've got to think about how to make that sound specifically for a very limited frequency response. Now, the human range of human hearing is about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. The range of the mobile phone is nowhere near that. You know, they, they vary based on device, but low end is gone. High end sometimes gets distorted. We've got a limited frequency response that we've got to, you know, take advantage of. So we like to build, you know, design with this in mind right from the get-go, and then make sure it also sounds great on headphones as well. But we aren't, you know, making it for full frequency headphone and then trying to cram it in to the the mobile speaker. So here's an example of a track that is from a film. It sounds great in a theatrical setting like it was intended or even in a home theater setting, but there's a lot of low frequency percussive content that you're going to hear uh, that is not, uh, that doesn't translate well on mobile. So let's take a listen. So these low percussive rumbles that kind of set this ominous mood. even hear those on a mobile system and I was actually playing back this presentation earlier this morning and I heard the track and I was like oh did I pick a bad track there's not really low frequency content here and it was because I was playing it back on my laptop and I, I couldn't even hear those but uh, so that would not come across well on mobile so we have to be orchestrating with this system in mind so I've got a clip here from one of the Lord of the Rings mobile games from a few years back that was nominated for great audio and um, you'll just hear that you know the orchestral music is orchestrated as such that it it doesn't uh, it doesn't have a lot of that, and the sound effects just kind of sit on top and um, kind of punch through cleanly, but um, yeah, so here's that example. 
So the music still hits hard. But we don't have that low frequency rumble. Like we can still achieve the same feeling without uh, without needing to tap into those. Um, so yeah, leveraging sound effects that sit on top of the music, trying to orchestrate properly, very important. Next is non-fatiguing. You know, how can we create that Hearthstone experience where they play that same track on loop, but it doesn't fatigue players? There's a few different ways. Um, one way I'm going to talk about is with an interactive layered system. So um, in this example, this is some music we did for a game that wasn't mobile, but uh, used a system of dynamic layering. So we have one track of music, and we've broken it out into different stems so that uh, in different instruments come in based on player actions. So I'll go ahead and start this, and you're going to hear a low intensity track of music uh, that's kind of an explore state, and then a danger state when they get in range of enemies, and then a battle state when they enter. So, start it off, and hear this kind of ominous explore music. It's just kind of there. And in a minute, the player is going to do something, and you're going to enter an area with enemies, and it's going to stack in this next layer of danger layer on top. So we've got percussive stuff going on, but it's very smooth, smooth same piece of music, and we still hear both layers playing. And in a second, the player is going to engage in battle. They'll attack an enemy. They'll be seen. And it's going to bring in this top layer of the Same piece of music, just more layers. And in a second, they'll defeat the enemy. It'll kind of transition back to danger, and then back to low intensity. So here we were able to take a piece of music, one piece of music, maybe it was a 30 second loop, I think in this case it was a minute or a minute and a half, and, um, and play it and transition between these layers based on the player doing different things. So it was very non-fatiguing because in the non-intense moments it was you know, pretty ambient and there, but still the same exact mood. And so using dynamic layered systems like this let us brand the experience, but at the same time make sure the player is not uh, hearing the same thing on loop over and over. So very effective, very, very effective. And I'll talk about how to achieve this technically briefly in the, in the next slide. So optimized performance. It's the last category. You know, we've got to be iconic and rewarding. We've got to think about the playback system. We've got to make sure it's not fatiguing players. And then we've also got to design with optimized performance in mind. So this comes in right from the content creation phase, you know. And maybe this is uh, trimming file tails to make sure they're extremely short. Uh, you know, without affecting the playback, but hearing, uh, you know, making sure you're not doubling the length of your file size. If it's a two-second sound, you leave two seconds of silence at the end, that's a big problem. So uh, making sure that we're taking advantage of that. You know, sometimes we get a game, it has uh, things that are, you know, not trimmed if there's already audio in it. We'll have to go through and optimize it ourselves, go back to the content, shorten those up. Also leveraging high quality compression formats. You know, AUG is, is significantly better than MP3 when you can use it. Uh, it loops way better, not the same issue. Um, mono versus stereo, you know, knowing when you can put mono in instead of stereo for your sound effects. Same thing with sample rate conversion. You can bring down VO to 221K really without doing too much damage to the file um, quality. AUG compression, you know, six to eight, you can get a, in, in this setting, you can get a pretty good sounding track. All of these things significantly decrease file size. And then dynamic loading and onloading of assets. So you want to granularize memory banks, you know, make sure small chunks of the game, you know, this level or this character's sets of sound or this weapon set get loaded dynamically and then onloaded when the weapon goes away. So very granular and then also looking at streaming, you know, we can set the music to stream in the background. We don't need to load that big file into memory um, and whatnot. And then also very important for mobile is making sure that we're doing cross-platform optimization when we're deploying to iOS or to a high-quality Android, low-quality Android, so we can set up unique settings for each one so we don't have to design for the bottom line. We can deliver the high-fidelity experience when the phone can take it. We deliver a lower experience when it's uh, got more performance issues. And all of this is very easy to do with tools like middleware such as Wise or FMOD or Fabric. All of these tools enable optimization much more so than the native 
playback systems in Unity and UE4 or whatever engine you're using. So, uh, you know, often when we work with mobile developers, they'll tell us initially, oh, you know, we can't afford the CPU overhead or the performance overhead of using middleware. And, you know, we always say, no, 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 like it's actually going to significantly save you um, purely because of the ease of optimization, you know. You can, you can do optimization, of course, with the native systems, but you can go much deeper, much more simply, save a lot of programming hours using these tools. And very often, you know, our developers, they use them, and then they realize they love it, you know, but with mobile, there's kind of a stigma, I think, of using middleware because we've always had to deal with smaller performance uh, considerations. So, um, so what's next in all this? You know, where are we kind of pushing toward? Uh, I think, you know, more data-driven and parameter-controlled design and implementation is important. You know, we've been doing this in PC and console, having player actions influence music, influence sound and how it works, using, you know, game data to drive this audio engine. We can do this more in mobile. It's now more of a matter of, you know, just taking the time or the budget to do it and not so, not even budget, but taking the time to do it and not so much as an actual technical limitation like it has been. Um, MIDI-based music systems are another very interesting thing that's come up with, uh, you know, for example, when they ported Peggle to mobile, they switched to a MIDI-based music system in order to optimize what was happening uh, with that and replicate the system of the full Peggle game. Uh, it was smaller resource impact because of memory considerations, um, but uh, still enabled the interactive system. And then, you know, people always talk about generative and procedural audio. But, you know, I, I, this is, I'm not deluded into thinking this is coming to mobile anytime soon. I'm not deluded into thinking that's coming to mobile tomorrow, but even just looking at granularizing your content, small music loops, working them together to create, you know, unique music from smaller chunks is, uh, is something we can be taking advantage of. And then, like I said before, audio middleware like Wise FMOD Fabric really expanding the functionality, saving us programming hours, and uh, just doing a lot for the mobile experience. So quick review, again, we're dealing with iconic and re rewarding experiences. We want to be thinking about the playback system, designing for that in mind right from the get-go, creating content that's not fatiguing the players, and then, of course, designing with optimized performance. Um, so I think that kind of, you know, wraps up what I was going to chat about. Um, oh, thanks. Any questions, feel free to, to email me. I, I think we've got time for maybe a couple if there are any. But uh, also, you know, I do a lot of talks about sample audio, con about audio contracts and people working with composers and sound designers. And I've got these sample contracts we just kind of give out. Um, if you want to go, there's a link there. Very useful if you're collaborating with people, some, you know, high quality contracts, um, just kind of as an ancillary note to this presentation. Take them. They, they help everyone in the industry. Um, but yeah, feel free to email me, of course. Yeah, you know, I think even just thinking like that, you know, not necessarily procedural, but maybe procedurally combined. For example, we, we take a gunshot and maybe you're going to have, you know, 10 gunshots in the game. You could maybe put in like two, but have different components. You know, you've got the click, the, the tail, the gunshot, and then all of these can combine to save, you know, you play them back together and the sound sounds unique every time and we've actually saved memory because we haven't had to load 10 unique files. We've loaded, you know, four and then we just randomize each element of it. So kind of thinking like that and granularizing. But yeah, uh, procedural audio when we get there, you know, being able to generate, you know, um, similar to a MIDI system, you know, but with sound um, would be very helpful. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always try and, sad as it, as it is, you know, I, I touch on, you know, the importance to the player experience and whatnot, but, you know, I think thinking in terms of developer eyes and saying, you know, if we use audio middleware, you know, then we get to do a lot of cool things, but it's going to save your programming team a ton of hours because the API is built out, they're not going to have to deal with it. If we use audio middleware, it's going to be easier to cross-platform optimize and you're going to get, you know, better performance on multiple devices. If we use audio middleware, you know, it's going to save you time and you money and then we just go do the cool things and then, you know, they notice, they don't, whatever. But, so, uh, you know, and then also thinking like, uh, I gave an example early on, you know, in terms of tapping into the emotion with players, like using it for evil, you know, developers like that, right? You know, you hear a credit roll-up sound, I don't know if you're here for that, but, uh, you know, maybe you brand the sound of this is winning for the player, and then maybe in a slot machine game, they're winning small chunks, but losing overall, and you're playing this winning sound, and the player thinks, oh, I'm winning, but they're losing overall, but you've got playing this winning sound, you know, like, use it for evil, for potentially, but, uh, you know, that type of thing, you know, how to tap into a player's emotions and, and how that influences the game. 
using audio functionally, you know, is important to them. Oh, you can display more information to the player, tell them more things about the game. Really looking at it from the developer side, not so much from the creative side, you know, is how I like to present things and how it's going to help them in their development process. Yeah, you know, I think they all have advantages and disadvantages. You could talk about any of them. Overall, I personally really enjoy WISE, but that isn't to say, you know, FMOD and Fabric aren't fantastic. A lot of it just depends on the situation you're in. Um, I'm personally like WISE, but they're all, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Well, thanks so much for coming. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much.